Welcome to the Africa Leadership Dialogues. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. We continue part two of our conversation on Talk South Sudan. Join us on the hashtag Talk South Sudan. Um, let me start with the panelists. We have already had an incredible discussion and really empowering, but also very sobering and disturbing in some ways. But are you inspired and what are you challenged by in terms of what you've heard from some of the speakers today? Ali, your thoughts? Well, I'm not South Sudanese, but I can certainly say that the, I am. A, no, but I, the point is that the potential is visible for everybody, that South Sudanese, wherever they are, whether they're in exile, whether they've had to flee their homes, whether they're displaced in their own country, whether they're still at home. We have to remember that the half of the country that isn't displaced has the opportunity to remain at home. They don't have to be uh, forced out. That this potential is still there, and South Sudan, to anyone who's been there, can, is, is obvious that the country can do great things, and it doesn't need to be uh, a problem for years and years and years to come. If the people of South Sudan have the opportunity to influence their own future, if the leadership of South Sudan recognizes that presiding over destruction and decay is not really leadership at all, but instead uh, articulate and see a positive vision for what the country can be. I, you know, I want to speak to the fact that South Sudan can be. It is already a, 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 a rich nation in so many ways. Um, when you think of South Sudan, what do you dream of? What do you visualize in terms of the South Sudan that you, Peter, and, and you, Nyagwa, want to see? If only I could take everyone to what's going on in my head when I think about a wonderful South Sudan. Um, one, one, th one beautiful thing I always think about is being able to just, I love hiking, so being able to just take my bag and go from one jebel to another without fear of insecurity, without fear of anything, and being able to string along you know, all my friends or all the people that I know. Um, but ultimately, what we all hope and what we aspire for, what we are all working very hard for, is a peaceful, prosperous and just South Sudan. Uh, definitely the South Sudan that we all fought for. Uh, I agree with my brother there that we, we sacrificed a lot in the 21-year civil war. Uh, many of us joined this conflict when we were young. And uh, one of the things they used to tell us when we were in the Red Army was that you are the seeds of tomorrow. You are the future of tomorrow. Well, I like to see that word actually becoming true so that there is a space for that seed to germinate and grow into a, and, 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 and blossom into a fruit, you know? That cannot happen in an environment where there is no peace. And the South Sudan we want is a South Sudan with peace. How do we get there? And one thing that I heard from the audience is our agreement in the fact that the situation is very desperate. And even people who are in Juba, my brother was in Juba uh, last week, and uh, the same messages that I'm saying here, I shared them with very serious people within the national security and the military, that we can no longer pretend, and even people in the office of the president, I told them, we can no longer pretend that we are okay when our country is disintegrating. This is not the future we fought for. I know Salva Kiir when I was in the army, and I can give you a good example. In 1991, when we were fleeing from Ethiopia after the TPLF uh, uh, won and uh, overthrew Mengistu, a bunch of us were uh, in this area called Gillo, is at the border between South Sudan and Ethiopia. And we, they, 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 during the war, the SPLA got caught up in the internal pro, uh, conflict of Ethiopia, in which we took side trying to back up the Ethiopian regimes, and this uh, 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 got the TPLF to start fighting our people. At the Gilo River, there were thousands of little children. Many of them did not know how to swim, and they were caught up. And where either they were going to be shot, or many of them were going to drown. And the SPLA forces that were there, Salva commanded them. Dr. Majanga God, who is now in the FDs, was the operational commander. And they fought for hours so that these children could be evacuated. That was clearly them putting the interests of the country above the individual interests, the individual safety and life. In fact, Salva Kiir had to be dragged out because he did not want to even leave. Soldiers had to grab him and put him 
uh, in a tank so that they can cross the river. Where is that spirit now? If I can ask directly, and I'm sure our president is watching and is hearing everything that we are saying, where is that? That spirit, where is the two million martyrs that died? Where are they? Where is the feeling, the promises that we used to make to them? That we are fighting for a South Sudan. There's a, a famous uh, a singer that we used to have, Amos Ajak, and he has a very a, a good song uh, in Arabic in which he used to capture the ideals. And everybody in the SPLM know this song. Where is that song? We used to complain that there was a, a clique that has taken over power in Khartoum. And because of that clique, this is why we had no voice. Now South Sudanese are not having voice. Have we in the SPLM become that clique? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And it's no longer who is Iho, Riek Machar, or all of this. This is irrelevant. The issue now is how do we save South Sudan from continuing to bleed and the responsibility with us? We have to be serious. If the president said the dialogue is the way to go, then this dialogue has to be inclusive. We have to find a process and build confident opposition and bring them in. This requires a political process. We need cessation of hostilities. And there's no two forces that are fighting each other. There's now so many different conflicts that are going on in the broader conflicts. And you need a number of different ceasefire arrangements to be, to be negotiated. So it requires that leadership. I really hope that our president, when they were fighting, they were saying we are fighting to liberate. And then you, the next generation, will take the country forward. I think those of us in the SPLM want to make sure our leaders starting from those of zonal commanders who actually nominated us when we were children and sent us to the Red Army for the cause of South Sudan. It's now time that we should speak to them, that the time for them to put the country together has come and for them to go home and retire. We will cherish them, but we have to save the country and move it forward. Wow, powerful. I, I, I want us to go into the conversation on refugees. Please, Joseph, join us. Um, Uganda is, is struggling just with the number of refugees it's housing. We know Kenya is housing refugees. The reference has been made. This really is about the people. Liberation was for the people, and therefore we need a stable South Sudan for the people. Take us through the refugee crisis and the way forward on this particular situation. Thank you, Julie, for hosting us. Uh, in the first place, I would like to say that the region or the leaders in the region might have not done enough. But in terms of hosting refugees, I believe we have to give them credit. But hosting them doesn't mean solving the problem back home. Looking at the number of South Sudanese refugees in Uganda currently, it is above 800,000. And anticipation is that if the economic situation continues to deteriorate, if the conflict continues, then Uganda is expecting to host 1.2 million refugees by the end of July. So you can imagine where Uganda is going to be when this 1.2 million comes into Uganda. First of all, it's going to be, there's going to be a competition over the resources in the areas where the refugees are hosted. And definitely, if there's going to be competition, it is going to cause insecurity within those areas. And this is now what the Uganda government is struggling to at least avert such kind of a situation. Uganda has been a friendly country to refugees since then. And to some of us, it's our second time being refugees in Uganda. But there are those with history of being refugees three times in Uganda. And my interaction with very many refugees in Uganda, there are a lot of frustration and indication that some of them may not possibly choose to go back to South Sudan. Yeah. So it is clear indication that South Sudanese, as Peter said, that if the situation continues, we are going to see half of the country actually being displaced. From the eastern part of former equatorial state, going to those end of Lafon, the other side, all the population have escaped. It is not necessarily because of the conflict, but it is also because of economic hardship. They don't get the basic services. There are no food, 
there's nothing completely that they can depend on. So the only thing is to come across the border. And the good thing with Uganda is that it has opened all its corridors and the borders of South Sudan so that the refugees come in. And one thing which is a credit to Ugandan people is that they are always so welcoming to the refugees. But the biggest fear to some of us who are interacting with the refugees, interacting with the host community is that this relationship may not last long. And another fear is that the bordering countries, I mean the bordering districts of Uganda, bordering South Sudan, they have relatives across the border. And if they continue to see their relatives are being attacked, being killed, then there's a, possible, there's a possibility that some of them may end up joining their brothers across the border to fight the so-called perpetrators or the people killing their people. So it is not only a threat to South Sudan now, but it is actually a direct threat now to Uganda. Kenya could likewise be the same, but of reason there are cases of refugees leaving Kenya rather going to Uganda. Yeah? It is because of the challenges that they face here because the land maybe where they are put is not helping them. It cannot help them farm. And most of these uh, refugees from the equatorial region are farmers. And the worst part of it is that the famine is going to continue in South Sudan because the farming areas, the population have all been displaced. It's starting from Yei, Kajukeji, Lanya, Morobo, Pajok, um, this end of the Madi corridors, uh, Mali, all this area, the population has been completely displaced. One worst thing you see in the population, the refugee population, is that they're heavily traumatized, they're heavily ethnicized, the ethnic hatred is deep rooted in them. Yeah? So you can see that they've inherited the ethnic divisions of the politicians and brought it with them. And that is an indication that these refugees need to be prepared so that they be the better seats. Otherwise, it won't help South Sudan. Thank you. Stay with the African Leadership Dialogues. Um, important to note that, you know, Kenya houses people in camps. Um, they can't earn a living. And so this is why Uganda finds it's really under pressure. And, and even though Uganda is going to be a welcoming country and we thank the neighbors for the role they have played in housing and taking in the refugees, why would we allow a second crisis to occur when we see it building up? Something has to happen. Something has to happen. I want to get a perspective on women. And I think, uh, Paliki, are you, are you with us in the room? Thank you so much. The struggles that women are enduring in this situation take us through, take us through this. A lot has already been say, said on the humanitarian and the economic front. But what I wanted to add is that as these crises happen and as they get worse, it is women who are at the forefront of it. It is when men decide to take arms, it is women who they're leaving behind. It is the women who have to now by default become heads of households. And um, one thing I wanted to maybe highlight further is the magnitude of sexual violence, sexual and gender-based violence in the country. And I liked what the speaker earlier said about that it's committed by all sides of the conflict. And... Um, I think um, it's, 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 it could be an action point for civil society to further advocate to make using rape as a weapon of war as an international crime because it's, it's happening at a very high level in the country. Now, um, the statistics, um, of course, one of them is the maternal mortality. Is, um, out of um, every 100,000, every, 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 out of every 100,000, births, there is uh, a, a 1,050 deaths. And um, there was also another report that came out a few months ago by one of the international organizations that um, one out of three women or girls in South Sudan either have experienced sexual violence or will experience sexual violence. And I think, of course, the statistics are alarming. One thing I wanted to really emphasize on is as much as we need a national political process, there is need for communities headed by women to start the local 
initiatives because it, the national process will not solve the ethnic hatred that Amanya just spoke of. There is need for us, and I wanted to really say that it is women who can easily shuttle between communities and in, start initiatives of dialogue, of you know, trying to address the problem because not all crises or not all conflicts within the country at a national level. Um, another thing also I wanted to say is that unfortunately previous gains have regressed. Um, in our transitional constitution we were very happy that there's an affirmative action. There was a quota for women. But now that's not even being implemented. Nobody's even talking about it. Um, we have a gender policy. We have national action plan for women, peace and security. But as much as we have all these good documents and these good policies, the reality remains that they are now you know, people, um, parties are turning a blind eye to some of these progress. So that just takes us like, you know, steps behind. Um, I just also wanted to emphasize that um, there is a lot of work that the women groups and women civil society are doing at the community level, uh, engaging even regional bodies on some of these issues that we are discussing. But um, um, the challenge still remains that whether it's nationally, or regionally, women are not always taken serious. And this is something that is very sad because when people sit on the table to discuss leadership, security, whatever arrangements, they always tend to think that women don't have any say on that table. But in fact, we bring the human side of it because security, definition of security to women is not the same to men. So sometimes it's important that we try to get the other version, the other side, or the other narrative, if I may say. I can come back to the panel. You know, we've heard the different views that have been shared and really, in terms of immediacy and the security situation on the ground, the humanitarian situation on the ground, you know, um, I would like all of you to share with us right now what must happen. We're coming to the close of, of this engagement. And so now it's what now? and then the next steps. So first, immediacy. Peter, what do you want to see? I'd like to see immediately uh, a launching of a political process. Uh, I'd like uh, IGA to work together with the African Union and the United Nations. There are already people appointed into these positions. IGA has appointed uh, President Festus Mohai of Ostawana uh, as the chairman of the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission. So essentially, the representative and I in South Sudan. The African Union has appointed the former president of Mali, Alpha Konare, who is the AU envoy to South Sudan. And the UN has appointed uh, Nicholas uh, Haysom uh, as the UN special envoy to South Sudan. These three people need to work together under the umbrella of Konare, hopefully with the AU chairperson, uh, Musa Faki, calling for an immediate, urgent, uh, convening of head of states, particularly of the uh, regional head of states, and also uh, a head of state from the AU5, uh, from the AU Peace and Security Council, uh, to begin uh, to start to initiate a conference in which a peace process for South Sudan is launched, so that this agenda of security has to be discussed, inviting all the different armed actors, all the different political elites, and different civil society groups to participate on it. I think this will launch a political process in which ceasefire and humanitarian access will have to be addressed. But these political processes also need to discuss the other issues that I mentioned before, that you have a looming uh, constitutional crisis where within a year, if we are unable to hold elections, and I know very well there is no way we can hold elections, uh, that means that that issue of leadership, how do we avoid a, a, a contention or leadership? Because if the time expired, and last time, uh, the leadership was only extended by a parliament, there was no direct vote, citizens were not consulted, yet you have economic collapse, you have famine, you have a disease epidemic, and you have civil war that has displaced more than half of the population. That will, there will be immediately a crisis of legitimacy if you go back again to parliament and say the parliament extend again the mandate. So that need a political process. So immediately, I'd like to see these three gentlemen from the EGAD AU and UN, studying a shuttle diplomacy, working together with AU and the neighboring countries to organize a political process for South Sudan. I think everything we've said here and that is being, you know, said by all the news reports on South Sudan is that, you know, going with what Chinua Achebe would say that 
you know, the center has not held, everything is falling apart. And in order for us to, you know, get those pieces back into the center, there has to be a sort of, um, all these actors that are interested in South Sudan, that have supported South Sudan in the past, from the African Union with regard to their role in establishing the hybrid court, from the UN with regard to their role to promoting peace and security globally, you know, and EGAD as the neighbor of South Sudan, they each all have to come together, you know, in a, whether it's in a, in a conference or whether it's a way to put all these heads together and figure out what is our strategy for ensuring that these abuses come to an end in South Sudan? What is our strategy to ensure that, you know, this hybrid court is put in place and that an evidence collection mechanism is put in place? What is the strategy to not only ensure solidarity um, for the refugees who are in uh, not only Uganda, but also there's a huge number in Sudan, a huge number in Ethiopia. Um, how do you make sure that the needs of refugees in, you know, outside um, in the region are also met and taken care of? And I do not foresee the answers to that when everybody's sitting in their own office everywhere, wherever they are based or situated. So it is important that there is a clear strategy from all the actors on how to end um, the continuous violations in South Sudan. I would like to see three things. The first is that the government of the day, the existing government in South Sudan, recognizes that a new political process is needed, that this is desirable. It is not something to be dragged into. It is about the long-term future of the country. It's not only about thinking in terms of the next three months or six months. This is about long-term change and that there be openness to a new effort. Uh, and that there be recognition that that needs to be an inclusive process. And that means different actors, whether they're armed, whether they're civilian, whether they're political, whether they're apolitical. Uh, the second thing I would like to see is that South Sudanese, whether they're in Kenya or Uganda or Ethiopia or Sudan, or indeed further afield in Australia or the United States, wherever in the world they might be, that they also unite behind this call that, yes, there will always be differences. It's a very diverse country. There are lots of issues from a long history of division, of struggle. But right now, what's most important is to recognize that we are South Sudanese first, and that means that we want peace in our country and we should work for that and we should call for that and not let our differences overcome that broader objective. And thirdly, and Peter has mentioned this already, but in terms of the international actors, whether that's EGAD, and also not EGAD only as an institution, but also the members, the neighbors, the frontline states that really have a very significant role and a very significant impact and influence and effect on what happens in South Sudan, the African Union, the region as a whole, uh, as well as uh, the broader international community, start to recognize that the conflict has changed. And so... There is a need not only to say, well, you need a ceasefire and we need to do things in a certain way, but to recognize the local dynamics, to start to work on that. Shuttle diplomacy is definitely needed, but there are also many, many efforts at multiple levels that really can't wait much longer. Simply waiting for the state to collapse further, for the humanitarian situation to further decline is not a solution. Important to recognize that the conflict has changed and we cannot wait any longer. We must act now. We're coming to the close, but I'd like to welcome anybody else who has a thought to share a perspective to maybe come up and do that now, just before we close the show. My name is Daniel Deng. When I see the African leadership dialogues, it means a lot. And uh, I always watch this when it comes. I, 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 I like it. But the problem of African we are always blaming outside world. And we trying to come out as a clean people. If we come back to the issue of South Sudan right now, South Sudanese, they don't think whether they can make it by themselves. They rely so much on the region, Africa, and the West. And we know very well what we fought for. We fought for our dignity, for our equality, for, to have a country. As we speak today, those who are in Cuba, it is very difficult for you yourself to oppress what you think South Sudan we want. So I do believe if you use this 
dialogue as a current use it for our leaders as current leaders not former leaders because i always see former leaders it will be good so if we go uh, to the situation right now in south sudan south sudan has been divided in a tribal level and it is become very difficult to bring these people together it will be difficult i would like to to hide this forum those are young leaders and they can make it they can make it those people who are here they can make it my brother was saying you cannot solve the problem when you isolate other part of the uh, the, the, the actors in the country i do believe so sudanese if you have a room where you can bring majar and and salvakir to dialogue by themselves and then show those ki- kind of photos it will be very important and it will be very good thank you thank you all so much for your perspectives um when you think of liberation and the struggle for south sudan to be born that was an incredible struggle and you achieved it surely you can live as brothers and sisters surely that is a secondary struggle and you can achieve that and as we close africa leadership dialogues i i as always want to share an african proverb and this one goes when there is no enemy within the enemies outside cannot hurt you and so to the people of south sudan when there is no enemy within when there is no enemy within when you are brothers and sisters the enemies outside cannot hurt you to the people of east africa stand with south sudan and stand together when there is no enemy within the enemies outside cannot hurt you and to the people of africa when there is no enemy within the enemies outside cannot hurt you blessings to you and blessings to africa thank you so much